thanks to um, Sarah Bassman and Lindsay Goodale who have been uh, great at keeping up with all of this and planning. So thank you guys so much for uh, setting up the stage for fall 2020 uh, virtually. So that's wonderful. And um, I can say a little bit about myself, but I'm Jillian Perkins and I'm the um, medical director of the Equine and Nemo Farm Animal Hospital at Cornell. And part of our reason for doing this seminar series has been to reach out to you horse owners and get you more familiar with our hospital and, um, and how to care for your horses. And then actually, who knows what next February brings, but one time when we do bring you into our facility has been our annual tour of the hospital. Um, but we'll see how 2021 is doing before we make any kind of loud announcements about that. So, um, cause as we all know, we're not really um, having visitors on campus at this point, but we're really excited to have you guys all here today. Um, Lindsay, do you want to say a little bit about yourself too? Sure, yeah, I'm Lindsay Goodale. Uh, I'm also a veterinarian and I am a Cornell Cooperative Extension's equine uh, specialist. Um, and I, Sarah and Dr. Perkins and I have kind of worked together. This is, I guess I don't know which number this is. I think we started it last December. Um, and we do have a playlist up on YouTube for anyone interested in the back catalog. Um, and uh, it's up to each presenter whether their talk is shared online, but most of them are on YouTube, and I think this one probably will be as well. Um, and feel free to share in the chat any future seminar topic requests, and we'll be happy to accommodate as, as we can and kind of ask our specialists at Cornell um, to cover those topics. And I know that dentistry was a very top common request, and so we finally got Dr. Early to um, share his knowledge with us. So thank you very much, Dr. Early, for agreeing. Hello, everyone. Um, trying to work through this uh, computer, it's hard not to see faces when I talk. And um, it, I guess um, uh, if there's questions, uh, uh, somehow flag me and I can stop and uh, go over things. Plus at the end, uh, we'll, we're going to break for 10 minutes or so or more for questions to try to answer things. Uh, there's two topics that um, I wanted to talk about today. Uh, one is dental floating and our current perspective on it. It seems to be over the last 10 years uh, been evolving in uh, our evaluation and uh, what it should entail. And then also tooth resorption, um, uh, long word called equine odontoclastic tooth resorption and hydrocementosis or just EOTRH, which was first diagnosed in 2004. And this disease is uh, every year becoming uh, more and more prevalent. So those two big topics, I'll try to just go over uh, in a short duration uh, for the next 50 minutes and then uh, we can uh, break for questions. And um, quickly, while uh, Ed just moves on to his next slide, I did want to introduce you to Ed, sorry about that. But Ed is uh, an excellent veterinarian and more recently has become uh, specialized in equine dentistry. He teaches our equine veterinary students, um, both in our, in our equine hospital and then also um, through a course we call the equine specialty rotation, which is coming up next month where we actually have a lot of hands-on experience where the students really do get to do a number of um, dental floatings during that week. And another thing that we've wanted to do with our speakers each time is say how they're kind of uh, into the horse industry. So I know Ed over the years has had many fell ponies and uh, Frisians and had a breeding operation looking after those. So, um, so Ed's been pretty pretty knee deep in a whole bunch of uh, babies in the springs in the past. So, so thanks for speaking tonight, Ed, and thanks for all you do for teaching the students and the horses um, and their care of their teeth. So, Problem. Thanks, Jillian. Um, so this uh, first slide, just kind of like to put things into perspective. Um, the first, you know, dental floating that's been around for several hundred years Dental disease and floating was first published in a textbook in 1855. So we've got a, you know, 150 years or more of um, uh, of having literature on it. 
But when you think about the horse uh, and the current skull anatomy, that anatomy has been around for 20 million years. So when you look at dental floating, something that has been developed, it's really on a short time span of what the actual horse has you know, been on this earth uh, with the type of dentition. So I just that that's uh, you know 150 years or 170 is a very small uh, snapshot of uh, their whole life on Earth. And dental float, the term when it first came out, was taken from a masonry um, terminology where they level things, like whether you're pouring concrete or plaster on a wall and trying to level it or smooth it. And when it first started, that's what they talked about with dental floating. And different terms have um, morphed uh, over time. And uh, 10 to 20 years ago, uh, dental equilibration was a term that kind of uh, ch changed into people thinking that uh, all the arcades uh, should be of the same angle. And uh, if they weren't, you should equalize them and, and file on the uh, angle of the occlusal surface to change it. Uh, and so that everybody had a preconceived idea of what a cheek tooth should look like. And if it wasn't what their preconceived idea was, then it was to be ground and, and uh, filed down uh, to make it look like that. And today, uh, oh, and then we've gone to corrective odontoplasty maybe about 10 years ago where we're removing tooth structure. Uh, and uh, today it's actually kind of gone to what we, I'd say a focal corrective odontoplasty, meaning uh, focal by tooth and focal by location on the tooth. Whether we're gonna do specific, a specific tooth, we're getting to the point now where we're deciding whether we take just an enamel point that's causing some soft tissue structure or if there's a tooth that's causing a uh, uh, a malocclusion with the tooth above or below it, uh, we're going to take a little bit of the actual crown down. So I could probably put another, you know, currently we are focal corrective odontoplasty. So it's been more minimal uh, even over the last uh, 20 or 30 years uh, as far as the amount of uh, filing of teeth that should be done. And, you know, relative to uh, clinical practice, I mean, as I said, uh, well, it's been around a long time, but in equine practice is probably one of the more common or most common procedures for equine dentistry. And the thing that's interesting about this is that there's really minimal scientific research that supports this procedure, uh, even though it's performed frequently and uh, in the past has been recommended to be done yearly or even more frequently. And uh, the point that we are trying to teach now is uh, to have an uh, accurate and specific diagnosis uh, before treating the odontoplasty. And this, this requires evaluating the oral, uh, with, with your oral examination on a tooth by tooth uh, evaluation, trying to get a total picture of what's going on in the mouth and how one tooth may affect movement of another tooth, or if you reduce one tooth, how that will affect movement. We'll talk a little bit about that briefly uh, as far as uh, orthodontic pressures and forces. But, uh, you know, once again, uh, you know, this odontoplasty should be very site specific, not only by the tooth, but on the location of the tooth. And the other point that, uh, you know, that uh, we're slowly realizing is that, you know, the enamel points aren't necessarily a bad thing, uh, meaning pathological. They do have a function in tearing and shearing of roughage during mastication. So our, our point of view currently is evolving to enamel points that either cause uh, soft tissue damage or causing some kind of malocclusion with neighboring teeth, uh, then we should uh, gently reduce those points or for a crown, uh, but otherwise uh, kind of be very conservative on the teeth. And <clears throat> this is just uh, back before oral endoscopy of how we use mirrors, but we have an overlong tooth. And the first thing you think is that this tooth is the problem. But when you see something like this, the real problem is a tooth above. And in this situation, it was a missing tooth. But the other thing to point out is that on conservative odontoplasty, um, uh, if you do about two and a half millimeters reduction, you're probably not going to damage the pulp underneath. If you, hit, if you come down to 10 millimeters, you have a fair chance of hitting pulp. 
And the 17 millimeters in this situation would be due to, would be at the same level as the rest of the teeth. And if you bring an over tall tooth all the way down uh, to the rest of the teeth, uh, you have a 60% chance of uh, opening the pulp and infecting the tooth. And so the point of this is that with orthodontic forces, we're finding that um, even if we just remove a little bit, you're gonna have a good effect for chewing, not necessarily take a chance on damaging the tooth. And looking at the evidence base uh, that I uh, talked about earlier with uh, different studies on dental floating, um, and if we look at that, you know, grade one is our most accurate, uh, highest level of uh, evidence and uh, down to grade four. Grade four is more just uh, descriptive studies or uh, reports uh, from experts or opinion based. Grade one is, uh, it's, a it's random randomized and it's in the species that we're studying. So then you have two and three that are kind of in between. And if you do a literature search on all the research projects that have been done where you enter flow equilibration odontoplasty, uh, you'll find 14, that may change, but 14 uh, articles uh, currently. Um, and on those, three of them are grade one, the top. Uh, six are grade three, which is next to the lowest, and five of them are grade four, meaning kind of opinion-based. And if you look at those three grade one evidence studies, all of them concluded that even though the floating improved mo uh, rostral call mobility of the mandible, it did not affect weight gain, feed digestibility, feed particle, particle size, or body condition. So, you know, all the things over the... Uh, decade or more of reasons for floating isn't necessarily uh, what we have thought it to be. Um, so it, it kind of makes us think, you know, what's the purpose of this? And if you look at, there's another study done about 12, 15 years ago, looking at um, the hand flow versus the power flow, and then looking at the type of file that is on it. And you'll have everything from uh, uh, carb, uh, carb, carbide chip to a diamond. This one up here is a carbide chip. And if you look at those and, and put them relative to hand versus power, uh, as far as abrasive damage to the tooth, uh, from left to right is, and down is the most abrasive because um, a lot of times you'll hear things like a hand float is um, more safe to the tooth and does less, less damage. Uh, but with uh, Patty Dixon's study out of Europe, uh, our most abrasive is a hand float with a carbide. Uh, with, uh, and then if you go to a very fine carbide on a hand float, that's next. And then a hand float with a diamond of all the hand floats is the least damaging. But moving over, that's still the hand float with the diamond is still more damaging to the tooth. Than a, power, than a powered instrument with a chip burr and the least damaging to the tooth surface is a rotary type of um, a, a motor with a diamond burr. Um, it gets a, a kind of an emulsifying protective layer on the dental tubules. So even though you think of a power instrument doing, you know, being more aggressive, if used appropriately, and I think that's the big key, uh, and meaning not letting heat build up and that kind of thing, Diamond burr would be less aggressive on that tooth. Um, and this is just two or three slides looking at forces. Uh, we've been looking at uh, orthodontic forces and how uh, removing a tooth structure affects the movement of the tooth relative to the mandible and the maxilla. And this is just to show the lattice network of the maxilla and how they're mo mostly compressive forces that are distributed uh, through the skull. And if you compare that to the mandible, there's uh, four major forces, uh, uh, compressive on the bottom, tensile, and two types of rotational. So that mandible is a thicker, denser bone to respond to all these forces uh, as opposed to the maxilla. But we're looking at those forces relative to how we move teeth. Now, I, I was hesitant to put this slide in here. Don't worry about the numbers, but the biggest point here is that if you uh, or your kid 
is trying to move teeth uh, with braces at the orthodontist, they only need a third of a pound per centimeter uh, square to move teeth. And there is so much force in a horse's mouth that averages, depending on where you're at, anywhere between 8.8 8 .8 pounds up to 70, almost 70 pounds. And that's, that's a huge difference between forces that are generated um, you know, for movement. And so we're, we're up to almost 200 times the amount of force needed to move a tooth. And it just, that point that I'm trying to make with this slide is a very small amount of tooth reduction to take it out of a occlusion will have a tremendous effect, much more than other species. And uh, just like in that photo that I had with that uh, overlong tooth, just taking even a millimeter off, once it's out of occlusion, you're going you're gonna, to uh, affect movement of that tooth. So, I mean, that's actually to our advantage and, uh, and also a reason why we don't want to affect the height of teeth too much because we can really be devastating based on the forces that the horse has in its mouth when it's chewing. Uh, this is just a slide that's going to kind of summarize some of the things I'm going over very quickly just to kind of explain uh, about our uh, thought process on uh, when and where to flow and how things have changed a little bit. And I'll be looking at uh, these things listed here. So first one, a few, uh, two or three slides on skull asymmetry. Um, 10, about 20 years ago, we, if we had a diagonal of these incisors, we would think about trying to level the incisors. Uh, but then as we started looking at these horses, we realized that it was the skull that was crooked. And most of the time it's the maxilla when you have this kind of asymmetry. And so looking at, um, uh, uh, initially we did x-rays and this is just kind of the anatomy, but this green is the mandible. And the red outline is the maxilla. Uh, this is our incisive bone and our bulmer and everything is just kind of making a right hand curve on the maxilla. So we have asymmetry, and so the argument of trying to make everything the same, right and left, was the, so our first light bulb moment that maybe we just need to deal with the crooked skull and realize that the angles on the right side is gonna be different than the left. And these are just more examples. This is actually the horse uh, that I showed you in the last slide, but it, it's the intraoral of the whole maxilla. And you see these teeth are straight on looking right down them and you can see how these teeth are shifted out. So there's a difference in the angle even in this skull. This is a CT study showing that angle. You can see how the hard palate is very short and blunted and the teeth are just responding to that asymmetry. So they're kind of at a sharp angle and then you can see the hard palate on this side is longer and kind of kicked out. And so those teeth are responding and angled out farther. But to try to um, to correct the angle on these so they're the same is just not going to work when you have skull asymmetry. And so what, as we looked at this, we realized that maybe we should just use the angles to that horse and not try to affect the angles. Because even in this case, back here, this case is about 15, 20 years old before I came on it. And there had been a, uh, the horse has passed away, but there had been somebody working on it for 10 years prior to that. And every time they'd level the incisors, two, three years later, the angle would be back, would be back again. And that's just because the teeth are responding to the crooked skull. And uh, so what are we really doing by trying to change incisor and maxillary angles? Let the horse, if, if the horse has crooked teeth or angles that are different, that's okay. It works for that horse because of the asymmetry. So that's one thing about, you know, that has uh, been different uh, that we've looked at. The other is the wave. Um, and we look at the, the way these teeth erupt, they naturally do uh, erupt uh, at different times. This, this uh, first molar comes out at one year and this fourth premolar comes out at about four and a half and it kind of erupt in this fashion and then starts at the back front and erupts. So it, it kind of makes a natural way based on the eruption times and based on this curvature of the mandible. You think of the horse as it's young and growing, um, they grow from this area forward. And so what would normally be curve of speed here and that first molar comes out uh, right here at one year of age, that curve of speed may be right here, but then it kind of flattens and elongates and those second and third molars have room to come in. So it kind of makes that natural wave 
And uh, actually, uh, it's just because of uh, the eruption pattern and the anatomy of that, what we call the vertical ramus, where it starts to curve upward. But sometimes that's hard to, to see um, when you're just looking in the mouth straight on versus um, with oral endoscopy or, or um, you know, a radiograph or with everything cut away like this. This pink is showing where the gingiva actually is usually at. So even though we have this bone structure, that gingiva kind of keeps a common distance from the crown. It'll, it'll go with it. This just shows the uh, enamel points, and we'll discuss it a little bit more. Are they really bad or not? And uh, we'll discuss that on slides. This is a cutaway on a cadaver, showing a little bit of a wave with the fourth premolar, and then just showing how that mandible actually curves up uh, and up makes that third molar and a little bit of the second molar appear tall. But in actuality, it's just follow following the curvature of the skull. And uh, if people are working on that and they're just looking in from the front and not, you know, obviously have a cutaway, but they're just looking in from the left straight in, that tooth could look tall. And what happens is you can see how that has been brought right down to the gingiva. This is where that jaw is curving upward. So it should have, a, it should be curved. You can see here where somebody filed it straight across with the level of the um, second molar in front and just dug right into the tooth. And you can see how the tooth is actually just trying to follow up the curvature of that mandible. So these kind of things uh, are very aggressive and can cause pulp exposure and infection in the tooth. Resorption is the most common thing, but also abscess. This is a one-year-old uh, thoroughbred. Um, and this is the, the first molar and you can see uh, you know, you already have that curvature because it hasn't had the growth yet. So the first molar has been filed right down uh, to the curvature of the mandible. Once again, that's a young tooth. Uh, the tooth just erupted. And, uh, you know, long term on that with this pulps exposed, uh, it could do damage to that tooth. It may take years for it to show up. This slide here is very wordy. But the bottom line on it is based on eruption times and the average life of the tooth is that there's an ex life expectancy of 27 and a half to 29 years. And our horses are living longer than that, um, uh, it, well into their 30s. And so you, you add the factor that every time you reduce two and a half millimeters of surface, you're taking about one year of life off the tooth. So, I mean, already they're behind things with us being able to keep these horses alive longer. The teeth already are not designed to last 30 plus years. They're designed to last between 27 and 29. So that's why we have to be very careful in taking off even more tooth to where we end up reducing this down you know, to 20, 21. And we do see horses that have been filed aggressively in their life. 19, 20 years old, and they have hardly nothing but uh, root uh, left because of the overfiling. So, structure. <clears throat> this this is a skull, and it shows these cingula that are coming up alongside. That's actually given strength to the tooth. And the transverse ridges are actually given an increase in uh, chewing surface. Um, if you think about taking a piece of folded paper and corrugating it and then stretching it out. It actually is giving them more chewing surface uh, and also giving a little bit of an edge for abrasion. And these cingula are giving strength to the tooth because of all the forces uh, we discussed earlier. So those, those, have, those have a function, the cingula for, for strength, uh, the enamel point, the transverse ridges for uh, uh, better abrasiveness and the transverse ridges for uh, more occlusal surface. And just kind of showing this up close here. Uh, this is the cingula. These are our transverse ridges. And uh, those actually have a nice function for mastication. This is just showing um, rostral profiling or bit seat filing. You can see the file marks where they've brought down uh, the whole front of the tooth. And uh, this is a procedure that has been done on the front cheek teeth, both upper, upper and lower. And uh, we are seeing consequences. I'll show you here in a little bit. This is a goat, an older goat, uh, 15 years old, and it, um, a goat like this um, 
actually started me thinking about the importance of an enamel point. Um, I was asked to float a goat like this um, uh, over 15 years ago, and I thought doing things like I did for a horse, that if I remove these points, I would help the goat to eat better and it ate worse. Um, taking those points off gave it nothing to really abrade uh, the hay with. And uh, it just uh, made me start thinking about the function of an enamel point uh, and that it you know, does have a function. And so uh, you know, working in other species sometimes has its benefit uh, and it's kind of uh, evolved into realizing that enamel points actually aren't a bad thing in horses either. And uh, you know, so we, we're always questioning you know, if we should reduce a point and if so, how much? And you can see this little soft tissue laceration here from this enamel point here, but these enamel points here and here aren't causing any problem. There's nice soft tissue. And uh, so you know, our current thought, if we saw something like this, um, is we would try to protect that soft tissue by bringing just the enamel down the black spot with the um, paw horn we would try to preserve, but just to gently blunt that enamel, I'm sorry, uh, right there. And the thing that you have to be careful about is, um, I'll get to that in a minute. So this is the uh, lower cheek teeth with these enamel ridges. Uh, once again, give a nice enamel ridge to help tear and shear forage. Here we have about the same type of enamel, and actually they've been filed a little bit, but we do have it cutting, so we probably would specifically reduce this enamel. Uh, but uh, in general, these enamel ridges are good. They actually give uh, a, a cutting, uh, shearing type of chewing effect on the teeth. Um, this is another kind of light bulb moment uh, as far as showing the importance of uh, oral uh, examination and oral endoscopy, because if you just palpate these teeth, you would palpate that and think you have a sharp enamel point. Uh, but what you can really see is that the whole tooth is shifted and tipped, and it's tipped so much it's trapping uh, Timothy head there of grass. And so it kind of makes us think, you know, of how we can get the tipping to stop rather than filing. Because if we just went by feel and we filed this down flush, we'd expose these paw horns. Uh, but we're really not correcting the problem. But this orthodontic, this is just showing an orthodontic movement and how we're starting to think of these teeth orthodontically uh, rather than sharp enamel point or not. So in this situation, you, you would want to evaluate the tooth below and see if it's a little tall or on that curvature of speed and maybe just take it out of occlusion so it doesn't tip so much. Uh, went the wrong direction. And then the other, the other uh, thing that we're starting to realize looking at these horses, you can see how all the cingula have been gone or, or removed, so everything's flat and overfiled. Well, then what happens is the cheek kind of tucks in and they start uh, abrading and causing lacerations of the whole cheek, even though all the points and cingula have been removed. I'm sorry, I'm hitting my mouse. Versus here, uh, you know, where we would address just this one enamel point on that buccal laceration. So, uh, then I'm going back to our rostral profile filing where you can see the file marks and how they've changed the whole, here the front third of the tooth, here the front three-fourths of the tooth has been ground right down. If you look at x-rays of these kind of teeth, you can just see up above, this is where the root used to be, and it's all resorbing and uh, it's just blunting down. Here there are, you can see where the roots used to be, but they're all just resorbing. And so the horse, like I said, it, the most, when, the, when you have a dental infection or uh, insult to the tooth, resorption is the most common thing we see as opposed to abscess. Dogs or cats or us, well, we would abscess if we had that kind of thing going on. But the horses, because they're continually remodeling and trying to erupt, they're trying to save the tooth, but the, they, they go into a long-term resorptive disease uh, with this. This is a, a older horse uh, when I was in private practice that uh, the vet that bought my practice went out to see. I had floated it at age five. You can see its environment here. She's lived at the same place the whole time, kind of out in a half woods, half pasture area. And uh, had only been floated one time in her life. You can see she's not skinny, if anything, she's 
overweight. And uh, on her mouth, you could see we had enamel points here. You could see they, uh, some of the enamel points were cutting into the cheek, so that those were addressed, but it really didn't affect function. Kind of back to the uh, research articles we were talking about that they never really showed where floating helps weight gain or better chewing. Uh, this, this girl's a perfect example. Uh, she had some little cuts on her cheek from those back enamel points, but she, uh, she was chewing just fine. And uh, this is the lower teeth uh, with her. You see those nice enamel ridges. Uh, and um, you know, this is the last molar. And um, so she's chewing and happy. And, and as I start seeing these enamel ridges like this, I think of a healthy tooth now changed our whole perspective. Um, this is a video. Uh, oh, so we'll get mom, they can. Our, uh, so this is oral endoscopy is so important here. Uh, so we can evaluate each tooth one at a time. And uh, as we come back here, you can see that enamel point right there kind of cutting the cheek. So we're going to hit that enamel point. But it, it, it gives us a very detailed picture of um, uh, of these teeth. Uh, hold on here a minute. The, the next one on the opposite arcade. Um, oh, yeah, here. You can see here two. how this tooth has been filed vertically and you actually have exposed the pulp horn along the front of the tooth. You can see that whole angle that has been done and that just that just insults the tooth. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's been exposed and the tooth is trying to remodel uh, some additional uh, denting uh, to lay down to protect it, but that's a, a bit seat. Uh, so six. See how they filed on the front of the tooth there. Mm -hmm. On that uh, exam, uh, we're looking at each tooth and the pulp horns uh, and components with uh, the enamel and cementum. And you can see as we come back uh, to the uh, 10 and 11, you can see those cuts right there. So you can see exactly which ones are cutting them. So that gives us a very site specific area to go to get those points off. Uh, but it's, it's, that's why I'm saying it's very specific. So on this 11, we would be hitting just this point right here. Um, and then on this case here, um, Show real quick. It's a long as my melanoma. That's the big at a, at a very young age where we extracted the first molar, which you should see here in a second. That's our second premolar as they start to move back. Uh, our third premolar, our fourth premolar, and you see the first molar is gone and it was extracted a year or two ago. Uh, but then what happens is the lower tooth. Uh, the lower first molar as uh, you come back. Uh, this is our sixth, uh, which is our second premolar, our third premolar, fourth premolar. And you see the first molar right here is just a little tall in that space um, where the tooth was missing above, right there. See that? So we are, this is an example of specific crown odontoplasty where we just want to hit a millimeter or two right on that tooth. And I've got a video here showing that too. Oh, yeah. um, we're trying to teach to there you go. There you go. very site specific. Hold it right there. Just that tooth Get down in just that time. location. So, uh, just showing and we look at how, so floating has become a very visual uh, site specific thing. And so um, it just shows that as an example. I'll move on. So conclusions is that uh, you know a minor reduction of tooth will have a tremendous orthodontic effect as far as tooth movement, and if we get too aggressive, uh, it can be devastating to the orthodontic movement and to the tooth as far as pulp exposure. And our most important thing right now is the oral exam. Uh, that we still recommend at least yearly, and if there's perio disease or other conditions, probably more than once a year. But our oral exam is our most important tool right now. So we can kind of get a, a, a monitor um, the teeth on a regular basis rather than just floating uh, without an exam. I, I tell students that uh, if they had to choose between an oral endoscope and a dental float uh, as they first go out into practice to buy the oral endoscope, they'll use that far more than the float. Um, 
So the next topic in resorption, this is just a quick break between the two topics. Um, I'm out in Pennsylvania in the Lock Haven area by the uh, Piper Airport. And uh, this um, uh, plane was trying to land in the fog and the airport is about a quarter mile north, but there's a mountain right alongside it. And uh, he missed, missed it in the fog, uh, went upside down, hit a tree. And the plane actually was up higher in the tree. This thing happened about 30 years ago or more. But he actually walked, he, he got out of the plane and walked out from there, but the plane still sits there on the mountainside. So it's a good place to go try to hike to and find. So, so the next topic and uh, shouldn't be as long as the dental floating, but it's this disease that I rattled off uh, at the beginning, the equine odontoclastic tooth resorption hypersemantosis, basically resorptive disease. You see resorptive disease in all species. Uh, and the horse is a little different in that they have this H or this hypercementosis, uh, which is a buildup of cementum. So here you can see <coughs> the resorption on these central incisors where they're actually shortening. Uh, you can see reactive bone here and you see this buildup of uh, cementum. That's what these big balls are. And they're the, they're the uh, outer layer um, of the tooth on, on the incisors and they just keep laying down more cementum, which makes this characteristic ball. Sometimes you'll see this disease start with one tooth. And in this case, it is just on the um, uh, left uh, mandible third incisor. And the, I was called out on this horse because it was rubbing its tooth that specific tooth on the stall wall. And obviously it felt pain there. And, and uh, when we did our oral exam, you could see that spot. Uh, and you can see the lesion on the tooth or the other teeth aren't as bad, but it was very focal on one tooth. Um, and it, we extracted the tooth, cut it away, and you can see how it's kind of working in around the periphery of the tooth down into the center of the tooth. And that seems to be the characteristic pattern of this. And this was, um, losing track of my age and time, but at least 15 years ago. And now we're seeing it more and more in all teeth um, at this level. And then another, another presenting situation we'll see is uh, a fractured tooth um, where <clears throat> the client uh, just uh, sees the tooth hanging out. But a lot of times it's this disease because the tooth is weakened or there's not much bone support to it. And then if they're rubbing it or bump it, it just kind of breaks off. So this is a when we see a fractured tooth in a late teenager, early 20 year old horse, we start thinking about this disease also. Uh, this is uh, from a cadaver, <coughs> Dr. Cox out in Minnesota, preserved his, these teeth, but this bulb, this is the root here and this is the crown. This big bulb is pretty characteristic of where it starts uh, in the uh, apical towards the root third of the tooth, making this big ball of cementum. And um, when we first started monitoring the disease, you would see that. This is a CT splice, and you see how it bulges up. You can see how <coughs> here on this uh, incisor, it started around the periphery and worked its way in, just like on that photo I showed you. And this one actually looks like it might have worked in from the root. You got bone loss apically on the tooth here, and it's working its way on the root. <coughs> and then now we're seeing this disease even more severe excuse me, um, with these huge balls of uh, cementum and they're just pushing right out through the bone. It's a combination of uh, bone disease and tooth disease. And you can see how these teeth are shifting. That's because they've lost their support in the bone. And so with the forces that we talked about that's uh, unique to the horse, uh, those forces will start moving teeth. Uh, sorry about that. They'll start moving and shifting as they chew. It's that same horse that's showing it's in the canines and the balls and you're trying to push out on the sides, um, just eroding right through the bone. Uh, X-rays here, you can see the lytic areas and the bulging hypercementosis around it. You can see it in the canines, um, not as severe there, but you see a leak in there. And you see how it's just eating away at everything. <coughs> uh, here you can see even some premolars that are just uh, kind of hanging you can see up here where the bone normally is and the teeth are just pushing right out uh, and see a lytic lesion here. So it's, it's a devastating disease. Um, 
our <clears throat> main treatment right now, there's that premolar that was floating. Our main treatment right now is extraction. We don't know the cause, uh, but when we get the teeth out, uh, they seem to be um, pain-free and happy, and they do well. Um, uh, the, the, the tough point right now are the premolars. We're, when we first saw this disease in 2004, it was incisors, and we started seeing it in canines, and now we're seeing it in premolars and molars. And that makes it hard because um, trying, you know, we, they, if we take all the incisors out and the premolars and molars are pretty good, they still can eat very well. But it's these, uh, it's these more severe cases that also have the cheek teeth involvement. Uh, it puts it into a little tougher spot clinically in how we're going to manage it. Um, and so the other thing too is when we get these real old horses, that have hardly any support on their cheek teeth. We have to realize that if we take the incisors out, we may drop that occlusion on those cheek teeth and even create more force on there. So there's some of these horses that have the real bad premolar molar disease that we're rethinking what's best for the horse as far as being able to eat. Um, this is um, an x-ray showing a, a mixture of uh, resorption only uh, in here. A thickening of uh, the cementum and resorption. These are more just uh, hypercementosis here, kind of a bulbous, got a little bit of a cementum here. And these are shortening resorption, kind of like what you would see that I described with uh, uh, bit seed, but you can also see it with this disease where they just resorb and blunt. Uh, and, you know, here's an 18 and a half year old horse that's having all his teeth out. And I showed this picture because, you know, all the incisors have been removed. This is a big flap we created, but there's no bone left. There's no bone that, uh, so their jaw actually ends up getting shortened by a centimeter or two uh, after the teeth are removed because uh, of the bone disease. And uh, the bone disease is one of those things that's kind of quiet and there but because um, you get so fixed on the, uh, the dental disease that uh, you, real, you don't realize you're losing your bone and your support. And so when you take all the teeth out, there's not much left sometimes. Uh, showing that horse how we make a flap and close it. Uh, they do very well uh, uh, clinically. Um, actually, they learn to eat uh, hay and even graze with their lips uh, very well following the surgery. Uh, just showing all the teeth that were extracted in this case. That's it. Um, take time for questions. I guess I should have addressed a little more. We don't know the cause of this disease and uh, it's a new disease. Uh, there's a lot of um, theories out there, uh, but uh, I hope in time we have a little more handle. Uh, we've looked at a lot of different things with histopath and, and blood work, but uh, really coming, coming up with blanks as far as answers right now. Uh, I think our research hopefully is going to go more to uh, looking at um, the makeup of the teeth with uh, some kind of uh, laser analysis of chemicals that may be in the teeth similar to what they do uh, in kids and humans when they're looking for toxins or uh, chemicals or lead exposure. It, it's usually embedded in the teeth so our current hope is that uh, we can start looking at some of these teeth with that technology and pick up if there's anything. Uh, so I'm going to stop my share and go to questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Early. We do have one question so far in the chat. Um, someone's asking what you think about the theory about green uh, being associated with EOTRH. I, you know, it, it's a theory and it wouldn't be the grain as much as if, if it's true. Right now, I have no opinion on it. Uh, but if it's true, I would be wondering about um, some of the uh, preservatives or um, uh, uh, chemicals that are used to cure our, uh, our uh, pelleted feed that also is a... Uh, uh, taste enhancer uh, like they do in small animal and uh, they are known to bind uh, calcium and I don't know if that's related or not but uh, in this study that 
someday we may be able to do where we would laser uh, teeth. Maybe we could find if there was uh, uh, some of those chemicals uh, that were in the feed used as preservatives uh, for the pelleting process. But that's all speculation right now. Um, no opinion either way. I mean, this disease is seen worldwide. And, um, and that, that's what's interesting. Um, you know, is there a common denominator worldwide? Thank you. And uh, someone else has a question regarding if it's early stages and only uh, one or two teeth are affected, do you recommend complete incisor removal at that point or do you remove the affected teeth and monitor? That's a good question because we've kind of vacillated back and forth uh, as we've watched this disease. And in some of the studies, in, one st in, in our study on histopath, we reported a small lineage lesion in an 11-year-old and then um, Travis Henry and his report out of UC Davis reported even one in a five-year-old. Um, so, I mean, those are very early small lesions and we definitely aren't gonna do anything at that stage. But the, our biggest clinical obstacle is trying to decide pain associated with the amount of radiographic changes that we see on those teeth. And it, it when we first started this, we were taking just the severe or the teeth that we thought were painful, kind of like that one case that I showed you from 15 years ago where one tooth was severely involved and the other teeth were okay. So I took that tooth out. We don't see it that way as much anymore. Now we're seeing it kind of through all the teeth. So, you know, on a case by case, uh, that's how I still look at it. But when uh, I, I kind of went through an involvement of trying to take just the specific teeth and they still seem to be in pain. So we try to find that one point where we take them all out, if they're all affected to some degree, and that's where we seem to get our, our best pain relief rather than doing it one tooth at a time. Now, given that, and with me stating that, there still may be clinical cases where I take just a few teeth that are affected and leave the others. Um, it's kind of a case by case, but overall, I, uh, once we hit uh, a certain severity of disease, uh, we tend for the most part, take them all out. Thank you. Um, the next question is kind of a loaded question, I guess. Someone is asking whether uh, the new thinking on floating is known among the general population of veterinarians. Oh, that's a great question <laughs> because you know, the, the hardest thing in life is to change. And, and um, I mean, I even, I, I think back, I mean, if, if, well, that's another story. I, I mean, I, I, I'm changing yearly. And if I practiced the way I did 30 some years ago, it wouldn't even be right. But um, the, the hardest thing uh, talking to veterinary students uh, that have gone out into practice is trying to incorporate this with uh, older clinicians and clients that are used to a certain that format of floating and frequency. And about a year ago, I finally went out to a local uh, AAP, Northeast AAP out in New Jersey and talked to the veterinarians. And I think the veterinarians, even the older veterinarians, are gradually coming around. And I think the other thing <clears throat> is that um, this oral endoscopy. Uh, more and more practices are getting it. And I think it's helping both the practitioner and the clients to realize that we don't always have to float these teeth. And they start seeing some of the damage that I've shown you pictures of. And, and when the clients start to see that, I think they start to accept that we don't necessarily have to float once a year all the teeth or you know, even more frequently than that. So it, it, there's a lag. There's definitely a lag there, but I think it's gradually coming around. But it takes time. And kind of tied in with that, someone else has asked, uh, maybe I think in regards to this regular floating, um, what your thoughts are on filing down incisors or leaving them alone? I'm assuming they mean on a regular basis and not you doing know, pathology. That's, that's kind of why I put that skull asymmetry case in there, because there was a case 20 years ago was filed by another vet every two years, level right down the, to level and then two years later and come back crooked again. And I came in on it 
15 years ago. And, and I, I did that uh, once or twice. And he was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, with it. So I think our perception of skull asymmetry, you'll see papers out there, uh, AAP and even in JVD that was looking at diagonal incisors and whether we should reduce them or not and how much we should reduce them and all that. But I think the general consensus is that now that we've looked at skull asymmetry, we really don't need to level the incisors. And, and the, the, the reasoning is that those incisors are the effect of the bite, not the cause of the bite. Just like in that case, I had severe bone loss of the resorption disease. Those teeth were moving because of loss of bone, but from the forces of chewing. And <clears throat> so the incisors are kind of the result, not the cause. And the cause is most of the time some kind of skull asymmetry. And then we have this uneven cheek teeth angles and so then you argue, should you correct that? And I think everybody is, is gradually accepting a crooked head. Teeth are gonna be a little different angle and let's work with what we have. And um, occasionally, if there's one incisor that's affecting how they uh, chew, you might wanna gently bring one incisor down, but to level them all on a regular basis, no, you're gonna create more damage that way. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, there's a kind of a broad question just about managing periodontal disease. I don't know um, if they have a more specific question. That's a, that's a good question because yeah. you, you have different types and um, sometimes low grade peri periodontal disease is going to be nothing more than a tooth that either a point or a um, a transverse ridge is going to cause the opposing arcade to gap a little bit and pack food and then that site specific of that point or that transverse ridge that one transverse ridge to reduce it so those teeth can come back together and that for early periodontal disease is probably one of the best things you can do we went through a phase of where we were um, irrigating all these pockets and treating them with antibiotics and I think that's more, uh, but what we found is if we just site specific, did a few local reductions around the pockets of the, uh, that were being affected, um, that we got a tremendous result. The gingiva type likes to try to reattach. Uh, the pockets will kind of uh, fill in. You won't ever get bone underneath, but you'll get a soft tissue attachment and things will settle down with very site specific floating. Then we get into uh, more aggressive pockets that won't change. We still occasionally do debridement and packing with antibiotic. Then you get some cases that are really severe and we start wondering about other things going on systemically uh, causing uh, mass uh, periodontal tooth packing. And the only other comment I've got on periodontal disease is that we tend, I think we have better hay here than Europe. Europe has this problem endemically. They feed a hay that's, um, almost like a, a haylage uh, with a higher moisture content. And it's a little more abrasive and they see periol with all these diastomas and food packing far more frequently than we do in the States. And I think it's because we have a different, we have more of a dry hay, uh, but that haylage type of thing tends to cause real severe periodontal disease too. That's interesting. Um, and then there are a couple questions on EOTRH as well. So someone's asking whether you think that the involvement of premolars is really uh, less common or just that people maybe weren't looking in the past? Uh, I think it's a little <laughs> bit of both. Uh, we are looking. Uh, the other, and the third thing on top of that is aging. Uh, some of these horses as they age are gonna, and so, cause we had some of these teeth that we would send in, uh, these cheek teeth for histopath. And uh, uh, Rebecca Smedley, well, that's her first question because some of these changes are very similar to normal aging uh, that you see in teeth. And so, you know, that'd be the third one. Is it just, uh, are these just normal resorption as the tooth expires? Um, we are looking for it more. And the only other comment I have on that is I have had some horses that have had more cheek teeth disease than incisor disease. And I can't explain that. But I can say that in 
tend to be a little more geographic. I, I practice at the, our satellite clinic in Long Island, uh, Ruffine Center. And uh, I've the cases I've seen have been there where they have more cheek teeth disease than incisor disease. And I, I mean, and then I compare to the practice I sold in Pennsylvania, uh, we hardly see it that much anymore until it's really severe, but we don't see cheek teeth disease hardly at all out here. And, uh, and then it's kind of a mixed bag up in Ithaca. There's definitely some geographic differences that I can't explain. Um, but I do think in general, we're seeing it more in the premolars and molars than when it first was diagnosed. Hopefully some answers are coming soon, I guess. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe related to this, let me know if you want to pass, but um, someone's asking whether you think bisphosphonates would be potentially uh, helpful. That is an excellent question. We're just finishing up a textbook through the veterinary clinics in North America, and um, uh, that I wanted to be, that's going to be addressed in that chapter, and it is a good question. And the the thing that we're trying to address in that chapter is that the disease uh, bisphosphonate um, jaw necrosis bronze, uh, but it, it's a, it's a osteonecrosis seen in older adults when they're on bisphosphonates. And so, and what they found as a side effect to that is that if there's dental disease going on, uh, the, that drug will actually potentiate and make the disease worse and actually cause a necrosis of the mandible. So the mandible will just be eaten away. So that's all we recognize. Well, that's bad. That. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't know the answer whether it could be beneficial or not, but we're trying to at least um, point out that if there is severe disease, resorptive or otherwise, uh, to at least be careful of that. I don't think. Uh, we have seen it, it reported yet uh, uh, in horses, but if you look at the this question on which one you use, if it's used at a similar dose or not, uh, that they do in humans. And there's, and I'm going by memory of, I think it's the or uh, is the one that's most notable, and I may be wrong on that, but it's most notable in humans. Um, so there's, there's a lot of questions there. And I think in that chapter, we're just trying to point out that there's a potential for a side effect with that drug. That's cool. Well, <laughs> in a scientific way, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> not great clinically. Um, so is uh, someone's asking a, another kind of general question, whether your approach to dental care for younger horses, so maybe ages three to six, is much different than for older horses. So for example, the frequency of exams. That's a good question because if you think about it, uh, during the first five years of their life, all their teeth are, all their permanent teeth are gonna be there. And there's a lot happening fast. And I think that it's not necessarily the filing, but it's the examination to make sure you don't have male eruptions or teeth kind of going where they shouldn't go. And so I think the oral exam, oral endoscopy is very important. And, and um, if, I don't know that you need to go more than, or shorter interval than a year, but at least a year. And if there's any question marks uh, as a tooth is erupting, you may want to shorten it to six or nine months. But I think the examination and just making sure things are erupting, our thought process of uh, prematurely pulling deciduous teeth uh, we don't, we kind of wait uh, until the other tooth is fully developed. So from that perspective, if you think about it, the tooth is developing in a dental sac that has blood source all the way around. And if you pull that deciduous cap, you just ripped off the blood source to trying to feed cementum into the crown of that tooth from the occlusal surface. So we're very conservative uh, not to pull caps prematurely, uh, but always monitoring and making sure things are erupting. So the examination, more than once a year may be indicated. Great, thank you. So I think um, the questions have slowed down. I think most people's questions have been answered and it's also uh, about seven now. So I think we can end up, a lot of people are saying thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Early yeah, um, in you. the chat. <laughs> and uh, from us as well, thank you so much for sharing with us. I enjoyed it. I wish I was more in person, but it, it worked out. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> yep.
And as Sarah said in the chat, um, feel free to email her. Uh, her email's in the chat right now if you haven't been receiving the emails about uh, these seminars. And if you do have a suggestion for a topic, especially for next month, October, definitely let us know. And um, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you all in a month. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you.